Okay. Hey everybody. Hello, folks. So my name is Alessandro Pilotti, CEO at Cloud-Based Solutions, and um, and I'm Peter Pouliot. I work on OpenStack at Microsoft. Okay. So for those of you unaware, Microsoft has been involved with OpenStack since 2010. And we've uh, worked together with Cloud-Based Solutions since early in 2012, bringing all the functionality that, uh, of Microsoft products into OpenStack today. Um, so that being said, we're here today to talk about uh, what new things we've brought to OpenStack for this release. Yeah. So here's a quick, quick agenda, okay? So we're talking about Windows as a guest. Um, the session is marked as a beginner, so we will try to really like to also showing you, let's say, which are the big benefits of running Windows guests in OpenStack and everything. How many of you guys are running Windows guests in OpenStack at the moment? Okay. Oh, there we go. Great. Then uh, Windows licensing in OpenStack. How many of you guys understand the Windows licensing in OpenStack? No hands. Awesome. I don't understand Great. why. <laughs> <laughs> then we'll have something to talk about okay, today. Okay, then we have good news for you. Um, open with switch for Hyper-V 2.6, so this is one of the great releases that we have in this, uh, in this time frame. Okay, not technically speaking, straight, um, um, uh, strictly speaking an OpenStack project, but very correlated, okay? Hyper-V Server 2016, as you might be aware, uh, Windows Server 2016 just got released, okay? So we'll see what comes new there, especially for the freshly released Newton um, version of OpenStack. Nano Server. Um, shielded VMs, one of the great features that we have uh, in Newton, and remote desktop and VDI in OpenStack. Any VDI users here, Manishas? Good. Nice. Very good. So, Windows as a guest. Windows can be consumed as a guest on any hypervisor within OpenStack. Okay, and there are no differences in the workflow in terms of how it would interop or uh, function with the OpenStack services uh, used during guest initialization. And uh, also, uh, you know, as part of this, those Windows images are typically sysprepped. Uh, we've created uh, with CloudBase some technology that helps to, uh, you know, create and uh, master, go master those images for you. Um, as part of this, one thing you should be aware, when running Windows as a guest on any other hypervisor other than Hyper-V, it's required that you use a certified uh, virtualization driver stack. Um, in the case of using KVM today, you have to use it with uh, an enterprise Linux distribution that supplies those VertIO drivers. And typically that would be uh, either SUSE, Canonical, or Red Hat, and an enterprise supported uh, Linux distribution underneath. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Well, one great advantage, if you have um, Hyper-V, of course, all the drivers are already baked into, into, into the Windows instances, okay? While if you use Linux on Hyper-V, Linux was also great on Hyper-V in the OpenStack context, and in that case, they're called LIS drivers, also part of the upstream Linux kernel, okay? Cloud-based in it. Um, you know, in, when you have a cloud like OpenStack, you need also to have a provisioning agent inside of your, of your guest operating systems, okay? In Linux, this is famously cloud in it. On Windows, this is called cloud-based in it, okay? So those are two different projects. The um, reason why there are two different products uh, is that uh, the, the, the original code base of CloudNet was very Linux specific, so we, we started um, um, a completely different project at the time. But the two projects, so the, the, the CloudNet for Linux, let's say, and, and CloudBase Init are merging into a single, into a single project, okay, called informally CloudNet V2. Um, feature wise, what, what does actually CloudBase Init do for you? Well, basically, all the things that you will expect from, um, from a guest provisioning agent. So, for example, setting the host name, uh, uh, creating users, uh, setting the user password, uh, um, static networking, uh, public keys, uh, automatic volume expansion. So, for example, if you have an image which is, I don't know, uh, 6 gigabytes, and you have a flavor which is 40 gigabytes, when you boot the, the, the instance, you want, of course, to have the volumes automatically expanded, okay? So this is what it's called grow root, for example, on, uh, on the Linux cloud in it, okay? WinRM HTTPS listeners. WinRM uh, is uh, very roughly the uh, equivalent of SSH in, uh, in, in Windows, okay? Uh, licensing. Uh, it will automatically activate for you the, um, your, your Windows instances, okay, if you want it, okay? independently of what licensing model you're using, KMS or not. Uh, NTP and MTU. 
In OpenStack, uh, typically the DHCP service will offer you um, um, a DHCP option that the client can consume to get the MTU size and the MTP service to be used by your, um, by your guest OS. Okay? Windows ignores completely those settings. So what we do in cloud-based init is that we have a DHCP client which fetches actually that information and applies it to the, uh, to the, to the guest OS itself. This is very important, especially when you use OpenV switch, because you cannot have an MTU larger than what the underlying uh, tunneling implementation allows, okay? Otherwise, you will have a lot of packet drops. And the most important one, I left it uh, for the last one, which is the user data. User data means whatever script, basically, you want to run as part of your provisioning, you know? This is typically a PowerShell script, but can mean also something way more complex, like a heat template. So all the complex heat templates that we'll see later, or uh, Juju charms or whatever else, are based on the fact that Cloud-based init can run actually a custom set of scripts as part of the provisioning process itself. More details, you have the read the docs documentation there. Please go there and get the, all the information. Um, how do we deploy it? Well, there is a very simple installer that you'd simply deploy automatically or manually, as you guys prefer. And when you're done, it will, um, it will simply get you ready for, for example, sysprepping the image and rebooting. Um, more information about the type of cloud supported. So it's not only OpenStack. It's also Amazon EC2 format, uh, Cloud Stack, Open Nebula, Ubuntu Mass. We use it very heavily, for example, for, uh, uh, for bare metal deployment with Mass, um, and so on. And there are actually quite some more than that. Some notes on the So with the currently supported Windows versions are Windows 7, 8, 8.1, uh, 10, both x86 and x64. From Windows Server perspective, we have 2008, 2008 R2, 2012, 2012 R2, uh, x64, and soon to come Windows, uh, well, we have support also for Windows Server 2016 today as well as Nano Server. Um, and it will work on XP in 2003, but it's currently unsupported. Yeah, quite a few people are asking us, so beside, of course, the, the big question, which is why? <laughs> beside this, uh, people say, hey, we have a lot of legacy with XP 2003. We understand that it's not supported by Microsoft. It's not even supported by us, meaning that we don't run a continuous integration for, um, um, for XP in 2003, so things might break. But uh, uh, there is no reason, actually, for, for you not to try it if you want it, okay? And if you need commercial support, you can still actually refer to us. Just don't expect us to run uh, integration services against, uh, integration testing, sorry, against it. Um, since we're here, another important thing, cloud-based init is fully integration tested, okay? Uh, we will talk later about CI in general, but uh, just that you know, especially with the huge size and installation out there, okay? Uh, we want to make sure that whenever we release a new version of Cloud-based init, we have uh, everything tested on every possible release. So just uh, one more second, as a result of this and a result of our testing of this, we've actually been told by some of the Linux vendors that currently the best supported guest on OpenStack is Windows Server 2012 R2. And actually, if you go look at what the other uh, OpenStack vendors actually support from an operating system perspective on their cloud, you can do the math yourself and see which one's the best supported operating system guest on top of those platforms. Okay. Hint, hint. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <bang. laughs> okay. Um, another popular thing is this um, trial of, of uh, Windows Server 2012 for two image for OpenStack. Okay. So if you just want to see how Windows can run in an OpenStack context, you can just go on our website and download a, a prepackaged version of Windows Server 2012 for two, ready made for OpenStack. So this is actually in. Uh, uh, VHD format if you're running Hyper-V, or in QCAL2 format if you're running, uh, um, if you're running, for example, KVM. Okay, that comes already with virtual your drivers and whatever is needed. Um, so cloud-based need is there; it's already sysprepped and so on. In, you know, as a point to make, in general, most people come to us uh, after they've started down the path of using Windows guests on top of KVM and have problems mastering their, those actual uh, images for their deployment. Uh, that's usually when we tend to, uh, you know, show them um, the images that create, we create, the curation process, and the automation that we put in place to, to okay. put CI and CD around this as well. Just to be very clear, the license that you have to accept before downloading the image, which comes directly from Microsoft, doesn't allow you to use it in production environments. So this is an evaluation only for testing, okay? 
If you want to build your own images, so in Microsoft uh, or for Windows, at the moment it's not possible to redistribute uh, ready-made appliances, okay, virtual appliances, so you have to build your own image. We build images for, for lots of our customers, of course, but you can do it also yourself. Um, how to build an image? Here there are a bunch of, uh, of the tools that we use actually internally that you can use yourself as well. We got a lot of questions, so at the end of the deck there is also information about where to have community support and please refer to those ones. Now, from a topics. licensing perspective, we often get asked on how, how can we use Windows, like how do we adjust our Windows licensing for OpenStack or what's the best license to use for OpenStack? Um, you know, in a lot of cases, people also want to use the licenses they already have. Uh, I guess the, the best answer for that is you can use any license in OpenStack. However, depending upon your use case, there are better licenses to choose. In most cases, we tend to drive people towards using a Windows Data Center license. And if you're going to be hosting other people's things on it, then it's going to actually have to be the, um, the, uh, I just lost, the SPLA, sorry, Service Provider License. Um, so if you have volume licensing, uh, any regular licensing keys, KMS, all those things can be used as appropriate licensing mechanisms in your OpenStack deployment. However, if you're going to be a service provider running OpenStack, it's necessary for you to use SPLA licensing. Okay. Any service provider here? Okay, cool. So one of the big, other big issues that we have, uh, specifically with our customers, um, who tend to virtualize Windows on top of their KVM OpenStack deployment is uh, VertIO, uh, and as we said, the Power Virtualized Device Driver Layer. Microsoft's put in place a program called SVVP, the Server, Val Server Virtualization Validation Program, which is a mechanism that we use to certify uh, workloads on top of uh, Microsoft's Hyper-V. Uh, in the case of this, uh, Canonical, Red Hat, and SUSE all validate their platforms on top of Hyper-V to ensure that their uh, VertIO layer functions properly on top of our uh, hypervisor stack. So uh, once again, we often get the question, does Microsoft support Hyper-V in OpenStack? Yes, we most definitely do. Microsoft will support uh, your use of Hyper-V regardless of what management platform you use. So uh, if you want to use Hyper-V with OpenStack, we will definitely uh, help you use Hyper-V. If, if you have questions uh, and you want answers from Microsoft on this stuff, please email openstack at microsoft.com and I will be more than happy to answer your question or help direct you to the appropriate person who will answer your question. Yeah, that's a very important topic actually. Thanks for clarifying, Peter. Because a lot of time customers come and say, but it's actually Microsoft supporting this effort. You yep. know? And uh, the reality is actually yes. this one. I mean, we are, we are using public uh, APIs in, in, our, in our OpenStack development, so it's exactly the same as any other Hyper-V deployment from that perspective. Correct. All right. Um, OK, so infrastructure as a service is great, right? So you get your virtual machines or your bare metal machines up and running or your containers also. But uh, you might want to get also beyond that, okay? So beyond going towards orchestration and everything. One of the options is HEAT. So HEAT is part, of course, of the, of the OpenStack Foundation family, to say so. So we have um, also full support for Windows workloads in HEAT, in, particularly, in particular Active Directory, Exchange, uh, SharePoint, SQL Server, including SQL Server always on, uh, IIS, and any type of... Uh, uh, popular, let's say, type of uh, workload that you might run on top of, um, uh, of Windows, okay? Again, cloud-based need takes care of, the, of running those scripts, but the, the heat templates themselves are actually containing all the PowerShell bits and everything, okay? It's not particularly different than, uh, than writing heat templates for, for Linux, with the difference, of course, that you, you have to use PowerShell instead of that, okay? Lots of people still think about Windows as like this thing in which you have to click to actually real windows, you know, and buttons and wizards and all that stuff, okay? That, that was a long time ago. No? I, I would say if anybody thinks that we can't run Windows identical to running Linux in an OpenStack environment, come see us after and we'll show you. Um, we, we believe that we can scientifically prove that Windows just runs as well as Linux in an OpenStack environment. Hyper-V. Any Hyper-V users? Nice. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, why Hyper-V in OpenStack, okay? And just a little bit of history here. So 
Uh, we are at the ninth release, so we started with Folsom, okay? Yep. Uh, today, actually, um, you, you know when Facebook reminds you about what happens a few years ago and all those terrible things that come up. And it came up, actually, a picture from the first summit that we did in, in, San, <laughs> in Diego. San Diego. So that was October 2012, I believe. Yep. And uh, I, I mean, it was amazing. I mean, looking at how our booth looks like today, you know, with all the crowds around and how it was like back then when we just started, okay? Nice memories. Well, I go back to Boston, so my okay. memories are even if, crazier if than yours. Old. So um, today we have support for uh, Hyper-V 2012, 2012 for 2, and 2016, okay? So 2016 just got released, but we have, uh, I mean, uh, already a pretty long history, meaning that we supported all the various uh, intermediate technical previews, and now finally it's RTM. So feel free to go and use it uh, as much as you want, meaning that since we tested it across all those intermediate releases, it's already very stable. So don't think about uh, OpenStack or Windows Server 2016 as a kind of V1 release, okay? Um, and just to mention, we also support Hyper-V on the guest platform as well. So when we talk about Hyper-V, we talk about it as the feature that gets enabled on the Windows platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and um, correct. So for developers, if you have like Windows 8, Windows 8.1, or Windows 10, that's actually a great idea. We have even a project called Imagine, which is not meant for production, but just for testing, okay, that will deploy OpenStack on whatever runs Hyper-V, including, for example, your laptop with, uh, I don't know, 8 gigs of RAM or whatever, okay? It will basically deploy all the Linux components in a VM, set up all the connection between the host and the VM, and, and deploy the host components on your laptop itself, okay? Very nice if you just want a cloud inside of your laptop with a minimum effort. Another important thing, so the Newton release got released today, okay? So it's live right now on our website in case you would like to download it and try it out. Now, CI, continuous integration. How many people are aware that Microsoft runs one of the largest continuous integration infrastructures in all of OpenStack? Nice, glad you know it. So we currently have roughly under 1,000 nodes sitting in a data center in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and we've actually been the number one voting CI since what, Atlanta? Yeah, so. Um, yeah, if, you, if, if you look at Stack Analytics and you look at the CI votes, you will see that we are basically the second one after the community CI. Yeah, we, we take great pride in assuring that our continuous integration infrastructure continues to exist to support all the effort that's going on here. From our customers' perspective, we look at it as a mechanism to allow us to give our customers a sense of um, stability and uh, higher level um, let's say support, given the current situation that we currently have to deal with. Um, so from that perspective, you know, we try to ensure that all the components we have, well, we do ensure that all the components that we have are having CI uh, to support them for our customers in both our upstream and downstream uh, releases. Um, so you know, I encourage you to uh, submit code and watch it pump through our CI. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great feature. You have to consider in particular that OpenStack comes, culturally speaking, from a, from a Linux background. And in, in the early days when we were developing, there were a lot of situations in which uh, um, somebody was actually submitting code that uh, you know, was tested, for example, originally on, only on the Linux uh, integration uh, CIs, and, uh, and um, it was breaking on, uh, on Windows, okay? Think about, I don't know, Linux signals or Linux-specific code you know, that got in. You know, OpenStack is written in Python, meaning that can run on Windows, Linux, or whatever, but of course there are also specific operating system pieces in there, okay? So having a CI is a, uh, running on Windows is extremely important because this will avoid, and actually it avoids currently, yep. regressions when people commit code which actually doesn't work on Windows. Especially not because people do it on purpose, like, oh, those bastards now they will see, right? <laughs> it's mostly like, uh, oh, I didn't know that that specific thing was not supported there. I don't know, the FNCTL library or whatever else. So, so what, one so, more thing to add here, just to talk about what, what's to come in terms of our CI. We've recently done a serious upgrade to all the infrastructure, and we're about to go live on Microsoft Gen 1 Open Compute hardware. So that's Windows running on Open Compute and running OpenStack. So from that perspective, you know, we have a, a very good story to tell uh, in regards to openness and uh, how we're working in these environments. So if you have questions after, please feel free to come by and ask. Another interesting challenge that we had was this one. Okay, great, we have Hyper-V, we have an extremely easy way to set it up uh, and include it in any OpenStack cloud. So our goal from day one was always to 
make sure that you could take a Hyper-V box, uh, put it uh, in an existing OpenStack deployment. Doesn't matter if uh, what vendor of OpenStack, I mean, it's, it's creating your or deploying your, your OpenStack, or if you deploy it by yourself, doesn't really matter, okay? We are used to the fact that in a lot of cases, people are adding Hyper-V together with KVM nodes, okay, to existing environments, so that's perfectly fine. Of course, you could deploy a, a, a Hyper-V OpenStack Cloud from scratch, but we always have to consider also the case in which you add it to existing nodes, okay? So once you do that, and you have, for example, 50 KVM nodes and 50 Hyper-V nodes, you might want to have your tenants being able to spin up machines, for example, Linux ones on KVM and Windows ones on Hyper-V, and having them talk among each other, no? So the first uh, networking component that we wrote was uh, the um, networking Hyper-V uh, ML2 agent, which is still, of course, available and in production, which supports VLAN and MVGRE, okay? But lots of our users and customers are used to OpenFlow, so VXLAN tunnels, uh, if not STT or Geneva now, or whatever else. And, and they use also to use OpenFlow and OVSDB, of course, to configure their networking, you know? So one of the big efforts that we did, and I will say also a very successful one, was actually to port OpenV switch to Hyper-V and to Windows, okay? So this works uh, for Hyper-V virtual machines and with Windows containers. And now just to make note on this too, OpenV Open Switch recently became a Linux Foundation project. Mm -hmm. So we feel that the work that we're doing actually helped to enable that. Okay. The driver, so we're talking here of course of a, of a Windows kernel driver with on top all the OpenV Switch uh, user space tools which ported, ported on, uh, on um, on, uh, on, on Windows, okay? So the main idea is that you, you have to find the same identical uh, uh, user space command line interface as you will find on, uh, on, uh, on, on Linux. That's why, for example, for, for OpenStack, the same ML2 Linux agent runs in the same way on, on Linux and on Windows, okay? So we don't have a separate um, um, OVS uh, ML2 agent only for Windows, okay? It's the same one. This is actually a work that happens upstream together with VMware and the rest of the amazing OVS community, okay? So it's not just a separate porting that we do by ourselves. It's, it's a community effort that uh, it, it, it's part right now also of the Linux Foundation, so that's such an important news. The Open with Switch project uh, moved actually under the, under the umbrella of the Linux Foundation itself. So OVS was not only before the de facto standard uh, um, SDN solution, now it becomes even more relevant because of that. So if any of you are SDN providers and you're currently building an OVS compliant SDN solution and you want to add Windows support to that SDN solution, come and talk to us after this and we can show you how to do that. One additional thing, so the kernel driver, the Windows kernel driver is fully certified on Windows 2012, 2012 for 2 and 2016. Actually, it's the first Hyper-V extension to get certified on 2016. And, and of course, it also on the clients, I mean, 881 and 10, okay? But again, we recommend the clients for development purposes, not for server type of workloads, as the name implies. Um, okay, great interoperability, Hyper-V KVM, tunneling, VXLAN, GRE, STT, and so on. Uh, it's also compatible with Open Daylight, NSX, and we're working, of course, also now with the OVN controller. So again, same identical experience, okay? Just a quick uh, note on what's new in, uh, in OpenV Switch 2.6, which is actually, you know, the 2.6 release just got uh, released upstream. Uh, we have connection tracking. This was a, a feature that we needed to add uh, since some time, actually. We, we scheduled it after the 2.5. 2.5 was basically the first uh, non-experimental, meaning fully stable release, and 2.6 is basically the first one in which we're adding also other stuff. Connection tracking is needed uh, mostly for OpenStack security groups in this context, okay? So with 2.5, we were basically using two agents. One was actually using OpenFlow, so the regular OpenV switch work for um, um, all the um, tunneling and so on configuration and segmentation, while uh, we had a separate one for, um, uh, for, the, for the security groups, which was actually leveraging the the networking Hyper-V driver that we use also without um, um, OVS, no? Great news with 2.6, we have uh, one single um, agent to rule them all, meaning that we use contracting also for, uh, um, for, um, for security groups. This also means that it scales much better because we just use OpenFlow for everything, no ACLs uh, managed via WMI, uh, same identical OpenFlow rules that you will find, of course, on, uh, on Linux and so on. 
Additionally, uh, as security features, we have name pipes support. Uh, this is actually very important because this way you because open switch basically delegates to the transport layer the security for the communication between uh, uh, clients and, and servers. Okay, so with name pipes we have the same feature that you will expect, uh, for example, on, on Linux with uh, with with POSIX uh, sockets. Okay, and we have also a ton of performance improvements. We are actually extremely happy about about this release. Now. So next, uh, how many people know what Nano Server is? Great. So uh, Windows 2016 introduces a, non a new concept of uh, a Windows platform called Nano Server, which is a sub 600 meg uh, instance or image of uh, a severely stripped down Windows platform, ideal uh, for using as a hypervisor or certain specific uh, workload use cases. Uh, one of the things previously, our target platform for OpenStack was, was uh, like Hyper-V Server and Windows Server Core. Uh, Nano Server gives us a, a really interesting um, footprint to deliver those, that same functionality. Uh, and, it, and it allows us to, to start getting into um, sort of a more, uh, let's say, typical deployment models, typical, um, yeah, I guess layouts for platforms that you would use in a cloud. So extremely small. We've done the work to tie it into OpenStack, to tie it in with uh, certain DevOps tooling. Um, it's, it, you know, boots extremely fast, and it's part of the Windows Server 2016 uh, platform. So as long as you're using that, you can actually build uh, nano images and then use those nano images as your Hyper-V platform in your OpenStack deployment or as your guest. Okay, next topic, storage space is direct. Anybody using hyperconverged deployment? Okay. So storage spaces direct is a very important uh, component, let's say, of, uh, of the hyperconverged architecture that I'm going to introduce with the next slide. Um, it's a shared nothing storage model, okay? So the main idea is that we're moving away from situations in which you have to have dedicated storage nodes or a dedicated storage appliance. We still support them, of course, in, in, in Hyper-V for OpenStack, but we're trying to get to a point in which basically each node does everything, okay? By everything in this case, I mean, of course, a compute, storage, and networking. And Storage Space the right comes with Windows Server 2016, and we tested it throughout, throughout all the, all the uh, development cycle of uh, 2016, so including all the technical preview, and we are extremely happy about the results. Um, supports data mirroring, scale out file server, so the same scale out file server architecture based on the great SMB3 technology is available here as well. Recommendation, use always SMB direct or NDMA slash RDMA um, enhanced uh, NICs in order to optimize, of course, the performance and make sure also to calibrate properly the, 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 the traffic that the storage will require. Uh, the good thing is that the same uh, um, uh, requirements as recommendation that come, let's say, in general for storage space direct apply also for OpenStack, okay? Because, again, OpenStack is leveraging this underlying layer. Here's the typical architecture of um, um, an OpenStack uh, hyperconverged deployment. So you can see the uh, four nodes which are fully symmetrical in terms of components deployed. On top of it, you have a uh, scale-out file server. And then on top of it, you have all your controllers and whatever, whatever you might need, as you can see behind, okay? Um, this might be a pretty large beast to deploy because you have, of course, a large of components to do it. We personally do it typically with Juju Charms and, uh, and that we develop for, for, for this purpose, along with um, Ubuntu Mass for, uh, for the bare metal deployment, but you can also do it with uh, um, whatever you prefer, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, or whatever other option, or DSC. Okay, we already covered a little bit this part. Um, okay, I'm talking a little bit about failover clustering. One thing that uh, came um, very often um, from people coming to our booth or in general customers coming, you know, Peter? Yeah, the people, you know, one of the typical legacy workloads that people continue to use are uh, traditional Windows or Hyper-V clustering. So we've decided to enable that as part of uh, Nova. So that way someone can consume or deploy a Hyper-V cluster in, the, in their an OpenStack environment and have it handle the HA component seamlessly underneath. Yeah, the, the typical thing that happens, you know, everybody's familiar, I think, with the pets and cattle um, um, dilemma, <laughs> to say so. So OpenStack was developed with cattle in mind, so with a situation in which 
you want your guest applications to handle failover by themselves and have high availability by themselves, right? But lots of uh, customers come with uh, legacy applications that they want to move to a modern cloud environment coming maybe from older type of virtualization solutions or even from bare metal, no? while at the same time developing their next generation of uh, applications, okay? We cannot just, you know, switch architectural model and say, okay, look, I invested 10 years to develop a line of business application, and now, voila, since I <laughs> just moving to a new layer, I just rewrite it completely because, you know, now we do everything with microservices and so on. So all those people say, well, I have this large number of applications, you know, it could be old uh, mail servers, uh, databases and everything, which don't really fit in the modern OpenStack model. So what we do here is to allow also paths into OpenStack by using and leveraging the host level Hyper-V failover clustering, okay, which is a feature uh, that uh, enterprise customers are very familiar with. So this is a very enterprise oriented customer. What does this mean? We will do that to the next slide. It means that, uh, for example, you can have a, an unplanned failover. You have one of your Hyper-V nodes that just crashes out of the blue, lost power or whatever happens. So your machines will automatically be respawned on, uh, on different nodes, okay? So the customer, beside, of course, the, the minimum interaction, interruption required for, for the machine to restart, will simply have their workloads working, okay? If you do it on a regular OpenStack deployment, this won't work. The node goes down, and also all the machines will go down. So this means that it will need a manual intervention to restart them. You can also have, of course, a planned uh, failover in which you do, for example, node draining. Let's say that you want to do, um, uh, you want to do a, a planned upgrade of your underlying host or, for example, uh, security updates that will require a, a, a reboot and stuff like that, okay? So all those things can be easily handled by the cluster and then they can simply, the machines can simply fall back, okay? Um, the Hyper-V Nova Compute Driver updates the, the status on the instance, so we directly talk, of course, with, uh, with Nova meaning that we absolutely have an intention here to have a second degree, let's say, scheduler. The Nova scheduler is the only scheduler that really matters, okay? The failover will simply move the nodes and update Nova is strictly necessary. It will never do it because of whatever reasons, okay? Um, network events occur like in the live migration use case. By the way, the Hyper-V driver is probably the, the driver with the easiest option for live migration because it comes out of the box with Hyper-V, it works like a charm. And that's also leverage as part of the cluster store. And we also test all that in continuous integration yeah. to ensure that it's going to work as best as possible when you deploy it okay. in production. So try it. It's something that, again, comes out rel relatively often. And now for something completely different, shielded VMs. Shielded VMs are something that, uh, um, um, you know, when we talk about hypervisors in 2016, we usually think about this uh, layer in our infrastructure, we got completely commoditized. So at this point, we don't necessarily care if it's uh, VMware, if it's Hyper-V, if it's uh, KVM and everything, no? Uh, quite different from, I don't know, 10 years ago, in which the features that were coming with, with the hypervisors were actually the reason why people were choosing one on top of the other, no? So now there are a million other reasons why people would prefer um, one or the other or maybe a different cloud environment, like, for example, OpenStack compared to something else. Shielded VM, it's one of those features which only Hyper-V has, okay? So all this preamble just to tell you that it's not necessarily true that all the hypervisors are the same. Each hypervisor has also different features. So Shielded VM is one of them. What's the reason behind Shielded VMs? What happens if somebody takes control of your host? Normally, it means that they own also all of your VMs. Shielded VMs address exactly this situation. Your underlying host, even if it gets tainted, so if somebody gets control, hacks it it, they won't be able to access in any way the virtual machine running on that, okay? So this requires a given set of components where you have a, a host guardian service, okay, that will take care of all the attestation and key protection and everything. You have the guarded hosts, which are simply the Hyper-V nodes, which are, again, guarded by the Guardian, as you can imagine. And then you have the shielded VMs. The shielded VMs are just regular virtual machines which are running with all these additional features. For example, the disks are completely encrypted with BitLocker. 
tempering is avoided, so you don't have any problem with the host. Even if the host gets compromised, you won't risk anything. Think about how useful this thing could be for financing or situation in which you cannot allow something like this to happen, right? And again, it's just part of Windows Server. Line migration is fully encrypted. There is no console access, so nobody can access the machine directly unless they do it remotely via, via network, meaning passing the security, the security groups that, uh, uh, rules that you might have. No? Instances are, are booted actually by a shielded template, which is basically just a glance image. There, you can find the link for, for more information, which I strongly recommend. Here is how it works. You just upload the template in Glance, and uh, you just set a bunch of properties. So, for example, you have to say that the, 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 the Glance image is shielded, uh, that you need to have a VTPM, so we have virtual TPMs today, secure boot has to be required, and a PDK that, okay, we don't have necessarily the time to get into details here, but it's, let's say, one additional info that the user has to pass in order to boot the image, okay? We use, by the way, Barbican, another great open stack service to host all the, to keep, let's say, all the secrets um, in, in this particular deployment. There is a link to a video that I would recommend you to watch. And uh, I will skip here because I, um, this is a 40 minute session, so we better add uh, some more content here. So one of the other uh, typical use cases that we see for Windows and Hyper-V and OpenStack is for VDI. And, uh, We've worked with one of our customers recently to sort of, um, let's say, develop a solution uh, to use OpenStack as the ideal sort of back end for your uh, VDI deployment, All right? So, you know, obviously most VDI done today is on, you know, Windows guests. Um, and we do believe that OpenStack is a great uh, IaaS layer to offer uh, VDI solutions on top of. Um, the VDI solution that we're, we're currently uh, working on. It enables both uh, Microsoft RDS and uh, Citrix uh, Zen Desktop, um, and can be also integrated with other uh, app layering technology like Unidesk. Okay. So one great thing about, about VDI is the fact that when, when we talk about virtual desktop infrastructure, we talk typically about uh, Windows guests, okay? So OpenStack is the perfect infrastructure service backend for that, okay? What typically misses is the, is the layer that connects actually the underlying infrastructure as a service with uh, the provisioning and the brokering and the way in which actually the users can actually consume those desktops, okay? It's true that you can just take a, a Windows instance, uh, deploy it in, a, in OpenStack, so spawn it, and, and simply have access to, to, that, uh, to that image, right? But that's not exactly how VDI works. VDI is much more than that. You need to have also policies. You need to have, uh, of course, brokering. You need to have uh, an HTML5 type of access to it, okay? So that's actually what we did. And, uh, and also app layering, okay? For example, Unidesk. So here it's a diagram showing how this thing works. So you can see that you have uh, the user, okay, connecting to a gateway. So the gateway will actually provide a first layer of filtering and policy. And this is actually the part of uh, of the Microsoft RDS infrastructure. So the same identical RDS that you know from Windows Server, here is applied in the OpenStack context. From there we go to, um, to an IS uh, uh, front end that will basically serve the applications and desktops. Behind there is a broker, and here is the most important piece of this conversation. In the broker we have a plugin that instead of using directly Hyper-V boxes or Windows servers, okay, will actually deployed individual machines in OpenStack. So all the logic for the broker is inside of this plugin that we wrote. It works great, and you know, a lot of times people are, um, um, let's say, saying, okay, that RDS is great, but it's limited in, the, in how much you can scale. Well, with OpenStack, you avoid any scalability limit. It actually scales great in as much as you want. So this is actually a great solution. And behind, as you can see, you have all the various OpenStack zones. So what happens after, after that plugin is just straight OpenStack. So you get basically the best of the two worlds. This means that you can use whatever hypervisor you want. It can be KVM, it can be ASXi, and it can be, of course, Hyper-V. Hyper-V has an uh, extremely important advantage, which is the fact that uh, it's designed for running Windows on Hyper-V itself. No? And remote effects is one of the great adventures that you have. 
So remote effects got also improved with 2016 and it's fully supported in, uh, in OpenStack, okay? In the OpenStack driver. I think we're getting more or less at the end. Um, just a note, huge performance improvements since Mitaka and also in Newton. You will see pretty soon uh, um, a blog post in which we'll compare performance between Hyper-V and KVM and other hypervisors and prepare to be extremely surprised about what you will see. It will be based on Rally, and uh, we will open source, of course, all the scripts so anybody can retry them. Just a quick note on containers. So, Windows, 20 Server, Windows Server 2016 now supports Windows containers. So, you can use, uh, your, anyone familiar with Docker, you now can have a Docker experience when interacting with Windows. And as you can imagine, we, did, we decided to take all that great Windows container technology and integrate it into OpenStack to ensure that all the existing container technology inside of OpenStack can now consume Windows containers uh, in that uh, use case. So uh, they're currently working on adding support for Kubernetes. Uh, it works with uh, both, uh, currently on the 2016 platform, there's two types of containers. Uh, there's a Hyper-V container and a uh, Windows container. The Hyper-V containers, typically don't they add a different networking security layer on top of the uh, yeah. container platform? So depending upon the use case, you would determine which type of uh, container you would consume. And I believe we can also, um, this allows us, can we run Hyper-V in a container yet? I can't remember. Uh, we'll get there, anyway. So, uh, as I was saying, you can use containers with Windows, you can use Windows containers on OpenStack. Okay, so if you have any questions about Windows containers, drop us at our booth, we can show you, talk to you, and so on. Last thing about, uh, we have full Juju support of charms for all the possible um, Windows type of workloads. Here are some examples that you can see for the icon from Active Directory, SQL Server, SQL Server always known, so clustering, uh, SharePoint, Exchange, uh, you name it, okay? All right, so let me end uh, the um, session inviting you to our boot, which is A5. We have HoloLens, and we have uh, a demo showing you how to deploy Windows, uh, uh, sorry, Windows, how to deploy OpenStack VMs uh, in this virtual world, okay? Okay, last thing, um, context, so OpenStack at Microsoft.com. So once again, any questions uh, regarding OpenStack and you want to hear it from a Microsoft person, you can email that address and someone will get back to you. Okay, and then we have also ask at cloudbase.it and of course the ask platform from OpenStack. I think we are at the end of the session, right? I think so. Any okay. quick questions while we're running out of time? No one? Go for it. So specifically using what, uh, yeah, can you give more, us more context? We do use okay, Windows as a host. Can you have a microphone, please, sorry, because it's taken. Yeah. So the question is, um, what about network speed? Because uh, you see when you have uh, any overhead on the infrastructure, it uh, results in network overhead. Even you may have problems in your logging system if this is a RC's log. Have you experienced something with that? So, you know, we obviously we find you have to use, it, you know, depending upon what type of encapsulation you're using, you know, hardware acceleration is, is pretty much required um, for certain, you know, with, with deployments. Um, you know, typically, I think, I'm not sure, I know you've done more of the uh, yeah, performance testing. Yeah, we're doing a testing. lot of rally tests for performance. Well, of course, encapsulation adds a layer of uh, complexity, right? And uh, that, that, that's not Hyper-V specific. It's any type of uh, situation in which we do that. We usually recommend to use VLANs when, when it's possible, but it's limited, of course, to 4,095 tenants, right? But um, um, for VXLAN, GRE, and everything, what we do is to use uh, hardware acceleration and hardware offloading when it's available and, uh, and, and limiting, of course, to the minimum the amount of work that needs to be done software. That, of course, is not Windows specific. It applies to KVM with Linux. Uh, it applies to, to Hyper-V and whatever else. So it's a, it's, it's a more of a generic uh, design question that you have to consider. 
But I guess okay. if you if you have something specific, you know, please feel free to come talk to no, us, and no, we'd no, love no, to. No. Okay. Just thank you. I just uh, know about some okay. uh, comparative uh, disadvantages in Windows. Okay. Uh, that stuff. Okay, come to speak with us or to the to the booth. Okay, I can tell you that there are no competitive disadvantages okay. <laughs> for Windows. Yeah, we we like to it, we like hearing that because we want to disprove you. <laughs> okay. okay. So. Thank you, guys. Anyway, thank you, everybody.